Welcome back to Atlanta Diaries. I'm your host Enma Popley. Thank you for joining me. In Atlanta Diaries, we celebrate unique and inspiring stories of breakthrough women to help future generations create their own. If you want to know more about Atlanta or listen to more episodes, you can visit my website www.enmapopley.com. You can also share feedback or suggestions there. My guest today is Jenny Dearborn, recognized as one of the 50 most powerful women in tech for five consecutive years. Jenny is a thought leader in HR, the future of work, and data analytics. After completing a 26-year stint in corporate America, Jenny founded Actionable Analytics Group, which is an advisory firm that supports human capital management and education startups from seed to IPO. A champion of equality, diversity, and community involvement, Jenny has been recognized with honors, including the Stevi Award for Female Business Executive of the Year and the Athena Leadership Award. Jenny is on a mission to make the world a more fair and equitable place. I had the most candid conversation where Jenny shared with me how she navigated her journey from a high school teacher to a C-suite executive and board member to influence this change. Without further ado. Let's listen to Jenny's inspiring story. Hi, Jenny. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Excited to be here. And I'm so excited to share your journey with my listeners. And I'd love to start with the first question, given that I myself am from the learning and development background. What led you to the path of learning and development? Yeah, I think I was uh, drawn to education as an industry. because i had not a great education experience as a kid k through 12 and so i was very motivated to help other high school kids that were in a same situation so i initially was a high school english public speaking and drama teacher so i went to stanford for a masters of education and a teaching credential and i was a teacher a few years and then i pivoted to corporate education from there So what kind of challenges are we talking about Jenny? Yeah, so I was still am have a lot of learning disabilities, but when I was in high school those were undiagnosed. So I was undiagnosed dyslexic, ADHD and OCD. So it wasn't until I was diagnosed in my first year of college that I learned uh coping mechanisms and strategies to work through the challenges of my disabilities and i wanted to go into education to ensure that what happened to me did not happen to other similarly bright but misunderstood kids wow jenny this is disappointing and interesting at the same time and I'd love to explore on You know, when you actually got to know about this, what sort of emotions did you go through? Like, was there anger? Was there disappointment? Uh, was there wonder that living in a developed country? How is it that nobody was able to figure it out till that far? Well, I mean, I am in my mid fifties, so this was a while ago. We have a developed country, but it was still pretty primitive, I think, in the eighties. At the time, the school district where I was attending had a policy of social promotion, so. promotion from one grade to the next not based on academics but based on what was good socially and emotionally for the child. So that's why I was moved from grade to grade because I was articulate and well spoken and clearly intelligent but couldn't read or write. So by the time they realized that I, you know, couldn't read, it was kind of too late because I was already in middle school and so I was put in uh, special education classes in middle school and high school and there was those were small classes with kids with cerebral palsy and full range of physical disabilities blind and deaf and you know I think I was the only kid with a learning disability in the classroom and it was tough i mean your first question is you know what were the emotions that went through i i had a very happy childhood i had no idea that i was being mistreated or discriminated against you internalize it when you're called stupid and retarded and you know some 
really harsh words, you, as a kid, you accept it. You know, you don't have the strength to push back. I didn't have the strength to push back and say, I believe in myself and you institution, you are wrong. And you, you move on and you climb trees. And I lived in my imagination and I was generally a happy kid. And it wasn't until I was diagnosed in my first year at American River Community College, I then became angry. It was at that moment that I realized all of the years were wasted and that I was mistreated and misdiagnosed and treated in a way that was convenient for the school, but not in the best interests of me as a learner. Yeah, I can totally sense that. And it makes me angry too, I'll be honest. Jenny, have you gone back to the school and made sure that they are handling these kind of situations in a better manner? No, I haven't. What I became motivated to do, you know, I was an English major and then I decided to be a high school English teacher and I wanted to save kids in whatever school that I was working in. And so I didn't feel motivated to go back to my original school, but I was very focused as a teacher on kids with different learning abilities but teachers are the great heroes in our country. And I only lasted two years. <laughs> I pivoted to uh, corporate education. It was a really, really hard job. So how did that pivot happen? What triggered that pivot? I had very grand ideas of saving the world and saving future learners. And the reality of working in a school is, you know, you have to figure out how to teach you know, Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet five times a day, every day. Well, I love Shakespeare, but I don't want to teach the same books all day, every day for the rest of my career. And all of a sudden it hit me how repetitious it was. And that was not something I was, I didn't occur to me. And so I, I pivoted to corporate education and it was relatively smooth transition from standing up in front of teaching 18-year-olds to, you know, 25-year-olds at Hewlett-Packard. That's really interesting, Jenny. Why don't you share with us how you thought through your career then from Hewlett-Packard to now? Were you intentional about it or did it just play out organically? It really played out very organically. I would describe my career from being a high school teacher to a C-suite executive to a boardroom director as really following my curiosity and following my interests. I taught high school for only about two years, and then I was curious to try working in a corporate setting. So I became a classroom instructor at Hewlett Packard. I worked my way up at HP and then Sun Microsystems, Docent, SuccessFactors, and SAP through positions of increasing responsibility and scope in both HR as a practitioner and in sales, selling HR services to the GNA buying center. I know you've helped a lot of what you call diamonds in the rough. So what kind of advice would you give them to help them to pursue their journeys? do a lot of research, know your stuff. When you are an expert in something, speak up and use your voice. You have to be your own best advocate and you can't wait for other people to open the door for you. That's certainly nice when it happens, but if you wait for that, you might be waiting past when you actually deserve to be in that room or in that job. And so you have to kind of make your own luck. You know, luck comes to the prepared. My mom always told me that. And so it's knowing your stuff and being in the right room and doing favors for the right people so that when the time comes, they'll return a favor to you. I always try and give first before I ask. So that in a way, when it's time to ask, you know, you can say like, I mean, you, you don't literally say like, dude, you owe me, but you will ingratiate yourself to people to return the favor. That's interesting. Can I double click on this a little bit, uh, Jenny? So while I appreciate your saying give before you can ask. So are you sort of intentional about giving 
doesn't sound to me like you're giving only because you want to ask later on. What, what do you think when I say that? I very genuinely and sincerely like helping people, supporting others, nurturing and developing talent, doing for others what wasn't given to me. It's an expression from sales, from sales. When I teach sales training classes and sales reps were like, well, I'm going to send an email to so-and-so. I'm going to say, I, I'd like to have a meeting with you, you know, because I want to sell you something. I'm like, you can't just ask. You can't just, I demand a meeting with a prospect. No. Well, what are you going to do to nurture that relationship? What are you going to do to make them want to take a call with you? I mean, I, I get that that's what you want as a sales rep for them to give you their time, but what are you going to give to them first to make them want to help you? You know, give first before you ask. It's definitely a mantra in, in sales. <laughs> Let's shift gears a little bit. There was a time when you were traveling 20 countries, right? So how did you navigate so many different things like navigate cultures, navigate your, you know, work and your personal life? Somewhere in between, you said you also had your kids, you did your MBA. So talk to me about the balancing act. Well, choose your partner well. So my husband and I have been married for 31 years. We got married just a few weeks after the day we graduated from college. He's the CEO of his own company, but he, his job is local, right? You know, he rides his bike to work and back and never travels. And I travel 50% of the time. So you have to have a balance, right? So that's sort of foundational. He worked at a small company. I worked at a big company. I work in tech. He doesn't work in tech. So that balance was good for our family. And I just have to show up as my authentic self. I mean, I'm six feet tall. I'm a giant human being, right? And I've been told that, like, you know, when I would have performance review at the end of the year, people would be like, try to be smaller. I'm like, what? I don't even know what to do with that. Like, I can't physically be a smaller person. You know, try to not be such a big person in the room. Did you actually hear those comments? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, I heard those words. And after a while, I'm like, okay, well, what does that really mean? Like, somebody told me once when I was traveling a lot, I'm too American. I don't know what that means. You know, so, you know, you try and sort of peel away these weird feedback and you say, what are people actually trying to say to me? And so my takeaway was to listen more, to be more humble, to be my authentic self, but also have a great deal of empathy for every culture that I go to, try to learn about the culture before I go, try to speak a few words of the language, be very open to the food. I would always try and listen to an audio book about the history of this country before I went so that I could engage because I love, love, love history and have conversations about that. And to just be really, really respectful of where every customer is coming from, I've traveled to about 70 countries and most of my travels have been work-related and they've almost all been because of sales. And I was always selling to the HR buyer. And so it's very important for me to be emotionally available to the customers and to be very authentic and empathetic when I travel. Any anecdotes come to your mind? Like I read that when you went to, I think, Middle East, you wore a burqa. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So when I was in the Middle East, I think I was in Riyadh and my local country contact gave me the burqa while I was on the plane and said I needed to put it on before I got off the plane. And I was going directly from the plane, from the airport to a meeting. So I already had on a, a work suit and heels. Even though I'm six feet tall, I, I wear heels because they're what's comfortable for me. So anyway, the burqa wasn't long enough. And so what showed underneath the burqa was the bottom half of my calf and my ankle and my high heel shoes. And whoa, <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I was wearing a burqa and a scarf and sunglasses and like very little of my face showing. And I got pulled into a room at the airport and, a, you know, devices taken away from me and asked questions. Was treated very respectfully. But my my takeaway was, don't show your ankles. <laughs> that's not okay. No one literally said that to me, but I know that's why I was stopped. And I should have put that together before I got off the plane. But you were prepared and you knew that you will have to wear a burqa when you landed in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember a trip in the Philippines. The Filipino people are not tall. And so when I was walking down the, the street, you know, from the hotel to the office or, you know, from the office to a restaurant or something like that, would just be swarmed by people. And they just sort of come up to my my ribs. It was so sweet. And they, you know, adults and all these people and that, you know, they're half my size is like Snow White and and all these people crowded around me and they wanted to um, have their picture taken with me, which was very sweet. And then also same thing in India. I remember in Agra, I was there trying to sell to Wipro. And then we took the weekend and we went to Agra to go to the Taj Mahal. And same thing was just sworn. I also, at the, my hair is short now, but it was to the middle of my back and red. I'm a redhead. So that was, that was a surprise to folks. That's really fascinating. Let's shift gears a little bit. Well, I know we spoke about it briefly in the past. Any favorite success story on who you supported and how did that play out? Yeah, it, it was so meaningful in my life to have people above me pick me out of a crowd and said, you have potential. And those experiences were so pivotal, not just my career, but my life. So I always want to do that for others. And when I go into a new team, I try to have a skip level and, you know, schedule 20 minutes with every person that reports into my function and say, just tell me about yourself. No agenda. You know, if you want to create a slide of like pictures of your life and your kids and your family and your dog and your hobbies, that's great. But let's just tell stories. Let's talk about baseball. Let's talk about family, whatever. Um, and so you find people that are deeply passionate about something and say, I love how passionate you are about ice fishing, which I didn't know anything about, but you're amazing at that in the, the light that comes into your eyes. When you tell me about ice fishing, we can tap into that passion and expand that passion to this project at work. Man, you could really excel. And that would be great for you. It'd be great for us. It'd be great for your family. I'm just looking for people who are top 10% of anything, whatever they want to do, be the top 10% and we can harness that energy into work. So, you know, some of my favorite uh, diamonds that I've found over the years is Gronia Wafer, who was so, so, so buried in the organization at Hewlett Packard. And, you know, I met her and I was like, my God. God, you're an incredible talent and you're so untapped. And so I typically find somebody like that and ask them to be my chief of staff. And so when I go into an organization, find somebody who's overlooked and then just put them in the room, in the room where the big conversations are happening and they'll absorb with time who the players are. And then you just give them a little bit more responsibility. Like, okay, first I just need to keep minutes then set an agenda. I now need you to track down some actions from this agenda. Now, can you take on a project and just grow their skills over time? So I've done that a couple times. Lauren Fernandez, you know, typically try and find women or people from historically underrepresented backgrounds that are super strong talents, overlooked, make them a chief of staff, and then when they really are soaring, then promote them into a, a bigger position. And you can help them jump several levels by doing that, just, just through exposure. Tracy, the former CHRO at Hewlett Packard is one of my mentors. And she told me a bunch of years ago that her measure of success for herself is how many people that she's mentored in her career that started 
lower in the organization and then were promoted and are now chief people officers at other companies. And she counted 23 in her career and I was one of them. And so now I have that same metric for myself. And so I'm at eight, right? Eight people that have worked for me that are now at an organizational level that is higher than me. And that just chokes me up. I'm so grateful to be able to do that for other people. That's beautiful. So you shared about one of the mentors in your life, which is your favorite mentorship journey for yourself, which helped you to see the success that it did. Yeah, for sure. My favorite mentor is Carrie Williard, who was my manager at Sun Microsystems. And she did the exact same thing where I was down in the organization when I first started there and she had a skip level and I went in, you know, nothing to lose as I wasn't nervous or scared. All of my big grand plans about what we should do to change. And she's like, yeah, why don't you come do this job? I was like, uh, okay. And so she put me in a bigger job. And then after a couple of years, she's like, now it's time for you to do a bigger job. And she just kept taking bigger bets and bigger bets on me. Yeah. So I'll just be forever grateful. Um, she always gave me the scaffolding to make sure that I didn't fail. And that's what I've learned that I need to do for other people, you know, help them along, but also give them coaching on the side to make sure that they're successful. I do a lot of prep with my mentees to make sure that when they get into that room and do that presentation, that it's absolutely spectacular. With my mentees now, I'll say, walk me through it. Present to me like you're going to do present it at the board. Let's do a dry run. Let me read through your documents. Let me correct all of your errors. And then so when they present, it's flawless, right? And then that's my win too, when they get all the credit. So I learned how to be a good mentor from Carrie. And I remember a research study from a long time ago that mentors advance in their careers faster than people who are not mentors. Um, so it's not just mentees to advance you, you in your career. What actually has the most significance in moving you forward from, you know, more money, more love, greater level, greater scope is being a mentor. So, you know, I had leadership in my scope at SAP and VPs, directors and VPs would come to me and say, I need you to send me to some fancy program that's really expensive at some fancy university. And I'm like, what you need is to give back. And when you give back, then you will be a leader. I'm not going to pour more into you. You need to start pouring into other people. And that's what will help you advance and grow. So Jenny, were these all uh, structured mentorship programs or you know, were you encouraging people to just take it on organically? Yeah, so they were structured mentorship programs with mentor-mentee matching. And then we would put mentors through um, development programs so they knew how to be a good mentor and you know, what's the difference between a mentor and a coach and a sponsor and things like that so that people were of good service to others. Jenny, let's uh, shift gears a little bit and love to talk about your book, Data Driven. So what inspired you to write that book and what inspired you to get into authoring? Yeah. So I have two books. Data Driven is uh, published in 2015 and The Data Driven Leader, which is 2017. And they're both stories of experiences that I had at Success Factors and SAP. Like what was the prior state of what was happening at work? What did we do to implement change? What were the results in, and what did we learn from it? So problem, solution, results, learning, that whole journey was basically the story for each of the books. Data-driven is how performance analytics deliver extraordinary sales results. How do we understand what are the success metrics of the best sales reps? And ensure that all sales reps can be successful. So that project became book one. And then taking those algorithms and applying them to the challenge of leadership became book two. Both were work projects that I talked about at conferences. I did a keynote at some conference and people would say, how did you learn to do that? 
or what did you read to learn how to, to do those algorithms you were talking about? I said, well, I didn't, I, we just made it up. I mean, I had tons in, uh, of help, amazing, you know, Sanchita Sir, who is an amazing support and, you know, lots of people in my team and, and vendors and partners supported us on this journey. And I just had enough conference participants come up to me afterwards and say, could you write that down so that we could learn it too? And I was like, it didn't even occur to me to write a book, but I just got enough encouragement from audience participants every time I gave the presentation. And what's exciting is both books are still used as college textbooks. That's just so interesting, imparting knowledge and learning and development through a different tool. Jenny, I want to backtrack a little bit. You mentioned that earlier you felt a lot like an underdog. So when did you become aspirational from this person who was angry and written off? You were talked about as one of the top 50 leaders in the tech industry. How did you change your perspective? And how did you tell yourself that you can do all this and more? There must have been a journey you sort of navigated to make that happen. I don't know that I told myself I could do that. I was very surprised when I got the award of the 50 Most Powerful Women in Technology. It was not anything I applied for, and I don't know how it... I think somebody at SAP must have applied for it for me. I'm not sure, honestly. My perspective is, how do I help the most people? What platform do I need to leverage so that I can have a greater scope to reach more people to be of service. It's like when I would ever interview for a, a job and someone says, well, why do you want this job? And you don't say, uh, well, it's at a higher level, so I'm going to get more money. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I'm going from a director to a VP or something like that. The right answer, it's about the scope which allows you to have greater influence so you can get more done, so that you can be of greater service to more people. If you have a small team, you're helping the 10 people that report to you. If you have a larger team, you have more influence and you can be of service and help to more people and a greater portion of the company or greater scope and influence on the corporate strategy. So my ambition was always, how do I increase my scope so that I can be of greater help and support and service? My journey was never, I want to have this level of success so that I can get these awards or financial benefit or anything like that. It's, it's always about, how do I help more people? Which I think ultimately goes back to, why did I leave being a high school teacher. I mean, each year I would have 30 to 40 kids in a classroom and I would have five periods a day that I was teaching. So that's what, I don't know the math. It's like 160 kids a year. So over a career of 30 years, how many people are you going to reach? Those are really important humans at a really important time. But also I was too impatient. I had a greater sense of urgency and so that was always my motivation, touching more people, helping more people, having more influence. And the, the Lucite trophies just came along the way. I wasn't anything I was seeking. Oh, absolutely. That was more metaphorical. Jenny, tell me, what do you think we can do to be the voice to help others then navigate these challenges? You've spoken a lot about vulnerability in the various interviews. So... How comfortable did you feel to talk to your teams about your challenges? You know, I think we have to be careful about the advice that we give. Show up, be your authentic self, things like that. I think people need to be cautious about that. And that, that it almost comes from a position of privilege to say, be yourself, show up because that could backfire on somebody. And you need to be thoughtful about understanding your circumstances and the culture in which you operate and whether or not that makes sense. So I did not share, maybe that wasn't the right answer, but I did not share with my company, with my teams that I had learning disabilities and cognitive disabilities and that I'm considered neurodiverse and that I'm on the autism spectrum. I didn't share that for 20 years of my professional life. I was terrified if anybody found out. And 
I had to work twice as hard to read through all the documents and it took so much more. And I think that if I had in the 90s and early 2000s, if I had shown up at whatever company and said, I need a little bit more time, I need twice as much time to read these documents, I don't think that would have gone well. But when I was at a certain high enough level, you know, I worked for SAP and SAP had one of its significant pillars of the diversity agenda was neurodiversity and and hiring 1% of the workforce that was on the autism spectrum. And I give a lot of credit to Anka Wittenberg, who was the chief diversity and inclusion officer at the time for a very progressive agenda. And because of that corporate statement, I felt comfortable raising my hand and saying, you know, I was already an executive vice president. I felt comfortable saying, yeah, and and I'm neurodiverse. My God, the outpouring of people writing me notes saying, thank you for saying this. Thank you for making it safe. Because of you, I feel comfortable. I forwarded your article to my kid who's struggling or you made it okay for other people to say that they were in that situation too. But when I was early in my career, there was nobody, you know, in a corporate setting who was owning up to that. You know, there's Tom Cruise. Everybody knows Tom Cruise is dyslexic, but I'm like, yeah, I'm not Tom Cruise. So I'm not, I'm not an actor. And so it's, you know, like this is, this is a different world. Like him being a dyslexic role model didn't apply to helping me, giving me air cover when I was early in my career. And so I didn't, feel comfortable. I do now because I've, I'm at a different place in my career. So I would say it's very important to show up and be your authentic self and to be vulnerable because it gives other people permission. At the same time, when you do that, look right and left and make sure that you're in a place that will respect you. If you choose to do that, make sure you're, you're really comfortable and there's not going to be any backlash. I appreciate this, uh, Jenny. It's a wisdom of hindsight. How would you advise somebody, you know, who's comes to you saying, I have these challenges? What are the factors which have helped you to succeed thus far? Yeah, you have to put in double the effort. I mean, certainly K through 12 was, in hindsight, a complete waste of time (laughs) for me, which was really a bummer, right? You know, you think about how much kids learn and grow in these years. And if I had a different experience, it would have propelled me much faster in my life. And anything that's in a traditional academic setting, you know, of like reading and writing and sitting still, those things still happen in a corporate environment. That's certainly challenging. But neurodiversity has been an incredible blessing when it comes to creativity and innovation and problem solving. And seeing around corners and having a peripheral vision and a big picture thinking that I think a lot of my peers don't have and has allowed me to, you know, put disparate pieces together and see connections in a creative way that maybe others don't. So I think being differently abled has been a real blessing in in a corporate setting in those regards so it really it's it's a mixed bag absolutely you know given that those 20 years must have been so hard when you said that you would be nervous or if you're worried somebody gets to know who then was your safe space where you could go and talk about it who helped you to then navigate this journey of 20 years i mean you put your head down and you get your work done. What's my safe space? Uh, My family with a disability, if it's not safe to talk about it, you just don't, you know, it's not like I let it all out with a therapist or something like that. I didn't, you just shove it down and you just power through. That's what I did. I mean, I talked about it a little bit with my family at home, but I just assumed that this was going to be something that I had to keep under wraps my whole life. It's not like it's bubbling under the surface all the time and you're waiting for it to burst through and you're waiting to be able to tell people about it. And uh, as much as you can, pretend it's not there. And so it was a real shock 
almost when I got to SAP and they said, oh, by the way, we're going to have this program about neurodiversity. I'm like, what's neurodiversity? I didn't know what that was. And they were like, oh yeah, it's for people on the autism spectrum. I'm like, wait, what? I was told never to say that word out loud. What do you mean you're embracing people with autism? You know, that, no, that's not something we talk about. <laughs> They're like, oh yeah, we're talking about it. And, all and it took me months of SAP normalizing this term and recruiting practices and all that stuff. And after I was like, maybe should I say something? It wasn't like it was, oh, thank God. Someone's letting me talk about something that I've been dying to talk about. No, I had, that was way deep buried. It took a while for me to feel comfortable. At first I was like, I mentioned it to one person and I waited for it to explode you know, like a very private meeting. And, and they were like, oh, that's great. I was like, wait a minute. That's great. What? (laughs) You know, it took, you know, and then I said it at a, like a staff meeting with like six people and I waited it for it to backfire on me and it didn't. And then I said it in an all hands of like a hundred people. And I waited for it to, you know, for catastrophic blowback and it didn't happen. And then I said it in a company newsletter and nothing bad happened. And then I said it in a, an article and then all of a sudden, and then it was in the press and then I'm being invited to other countries to get on a stage and present awards representing neurodiversity. That was not anything I ever thought would happen. How it's positively received by people is nothing I could have ever anticipated. At some level, for no fault of yours, Jenny, you felt like it was a stigma? Yeah, it was a stigma, of course. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up being told I was retarded. I mean, how could in 20, 30 years that all of a sudden that's something that's celebrated? I mean, I just never fathomed that. Never in my wildest dreams would I imagine that we would be in this situation now. You know, I'm asked to speak at schools all the time and I tell my story, like discriminated against, told you're stupid, didn't realize that that was bad. It was just like, all right, I guess it's the way it is. And then when I'm diagnosed, then I become full of rage, anger. And I had this jet fuel backpack of anger. And I was like, I'm going to be the most successful person in the world because I'm going to prove everybody that I went to high school. I'm going to prove them wrong, those sons of bitches. And I'm going to grind my success into their their faces. And I was fueled with all this anger. And then I, after 10 years of striving, 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 I'm just like, what am I doing? This is ridiculous. This is not making me happy. This is not a way to live a life. I'm just going to get back to just being a regular old person, (laughs) but it's like trying to do good in the world. And then with time, something that was the worst thing in your life becomes something that's celebrated. And I just never would have anticipated that journey. And so that's what I tell kids. You know, I'm you know, I'm asked to be keynote speakers at high school graduations and things like that. And all I say is, if you've had a crap K through 12, all I can tell you is it gets a whole lot better from here. And you got to stick around and you got to put in the work because those good results are coming. Those awards and trophies and Lucite trophies, they're coming. You just don't know it now. And you can't anticipate right now that all the crap that you've been through, you know, is actually going to pay off and be an incredibly valuable experiences that will fuel you and fuel your success moving forward. Thank you for sharing this, Jenny. Jenny, if there's one thing, if you had to rewind your life, and if you wish that school did it differently, will you be able to put a finger on that? Oh, wow. I wish that I had gone to a school that had diagnosed me early and had put me in classes to help me thrive as a neurodiverse kid. I mean, there's some amazing the schools that have special programs for ADHD and dyslexic kids that are doing phenomenal work. And I love, love, love touring them and speaking with them. They're fantastic. And I just think instead of 
squishing your dyslexia and your ADHD into a little box? How do you go through school and just let it out and let it thrive? Um, that's what I wish I had differently. Did you ever hold your mom and dad? Did you hold it against them? Wow, this is a conversation with my therapist all the time. Um, yeah, absolutely. Went through lots of years of being super angry at my parents. But, you know, again, this conversation with my therapist, I'm number five out of six kids. We grew up without much money at all in a small, a little farm town. And my parents had their share of trauma and hardships when they were growing up. And my dad was orphaned. They did absolutely the best they could. And what we were not short of in our family was love and laughter and compassion. I absolutely knew I was loved and they did the best they could. And we had so much fun. Thank you for sharing this, Jenny. I'm sure this is going to help a lot of listeners. Jenny, on a lighter note, somewhere I saw where you painted this lovely canvas of superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about how did that become your um, theme? I like to say that I was into superheroes before it became cool. Everyone's into superheroes. I'm like, haha, yeah, but I've been doing it for 50 years. So I taught myself to read by reading comics, probably in fifth grade or something like that, you know, when most kids are reading in first grade. And then I love the art. I love the colors. You know, it's a beautiful art form, comic drawing. You know, and also what superheroes represent, fighting for the underdog, the humanity combined with justice, the clarity of good versus evil, all of these things really spoke to me. And then also my husband and I, 20 years ago, we moved into the house we have now, which is a dilapidated falling into the ground, red tagged by the city, which means that it's like dangerous, this old Victorian house. And we couldn't afford any anything for the walls. And I love art. And I was like, I'm just going to do it myself. What's the worst can happen? And my husband was like, well, what do you love? And I said, well, more than anything, I love superheroes. So he said, well, then do it. So I rode my skateboard downtown to the arts center. And then I put this eight foot by six foot canvas on my skateboard. And I walked to this canvas home because it was too big to get into a car. And I just hung up these white canvases all over my walls. And I just stared at them for a long time and like until it came to me. And so, yeah, so I started sketching my favorite scenes from comics. And then all of a sudden my house is full with so many superhero paintings. Now I've run out of wall space and I, I can't give them away fast enough. Oh, that's beautiful. So is the house still full of the same painting? Oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's bursting with super <laughs> giant, you know, but they're like the smallest one is five feet by seven feet. Oh, wow. So, but the kids must be loving it. I'm sure. Thank God I'm an empty nester. They're all gone now. So, um, I, adios. Yeah. But it was certainly something that they had to deal with when they were growing up is that I was constantly painting <laughs> superheroes. Jenny, I read about your husband's amazing effort for raising money for cancer research. My God, it sounded like a really, really scary and a courageous experience. So talk to me about that and how did all of you deal with it? Yeah, yeah. So he loves ultra distance racing, was on the cycling team at UCLA in college. And... He's very touched by cancer loss in his family, his mom, his dad, his sister. So he wants to do something to raise money for cancer research. So he would go on these 500 mile without stopping, 1,000 miles without stopping, uh, these races to raise money. And, and I said to him at one point, well, you're doing this race called the Race Across America, which is considered the toughest endurance sporting event in the world. It's twice as long as the Tour de France in a third the time, but no one's ever heard of it. And there's no prize money. And if you just take still photographs, people aren't going to be able to appreciate what you're doing. So you really need video. And so I said, well, I'll find some video guys who will go along on this three-week bike race. It's 3,070 miles and you have 12 days to complete it. So you start in Oceanside, California and end in Annapolis, Maryland. 
So you have 12 days as a soloist. He's ridden it twice, 2014 and the second race that I got the video for is 2019. And then when they came back, they had all this footage. So I was like, well, let's hire a, an editor, you know, so through some contacts, I found an editor, turned over 3000 hours of video footage to this editor. And then the editor came back with a documentary and I was, oh, shoot. So let's find someone who can market the documentary to film festivals. And then that went well. And I was, oh, gosh, let's find someone who can sell it. That's is kind of the story of how I became an accidental film producer. So we sold it to Apple TV last year. And then we ended up winning bronze telly award in the sports film category. Yeah. So the documentary is called Until the Wheels Come Off. And it is the story of his journey training for and riding and almost not making it in the race across America in the summer of 2019. What comes out in the film is just how crazy the experience is. He is very injured in the film, you'll see, and is not able to ride his bike anymore. But he's fine and he's now a runner. It's extremely nerve wracking. And how did you and the family sort of deal with it like when he was in that trip? It was very tough. Well, if you see the film, you'll see that the intention of creating the film was to capture his journey. But accidentally, as things happen in real life, what the movie is about is my husband's hysterical wife, me, who thinks he's going to die the entire time. And our three kids are part of his crew. He's a 10-person crew because he never sleeps. He doesn't sleep for 12 days. The support team have to be awake all the time, handing him food out of the van window. And to see his body break down and his, you know, he becomes delusional. He, you know, is falling asleep on his bike and swerving in and out of traffic is absolutely terrifying. You can't be in front of him or behind him, right? Because that would be drafting. So he's on his own. And all you can do is be a hundred yards behind in the, in the van and just go, okay, I'm about to watch him get killed. It's absolutely terrifying. And so what you see in the movie is me sobbing, begging, pleading, screaming, threatening, just going bonkers, losing my mind. That is really scary. And the kids were in favor of it? The kids were supportive of their dad and are very sweet and much more emotionally balanced than their mother. <laughs> <laughs> the end of the day, you are the one who helped him produce the movies. Yeah. I mean, what I said to the editor was just make a good movie. Even if I come out looking like the crazy person, if it's a good movie, that's fine. So he did what I said. He's <laughs> like, yep, you're crazy, but it's a great movie. I got a glimpse of it, but I'm going to go back and watch the entire documentary. Yeah. Before the end of the conversation, I want to touch a little bit upon your journey as a board member. When I started Atlanta Diaries and I did like a little research with women across the globe, some very interesting themes came out of that research. I read your favorite quote, Madeleine Albright's quote, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. And my uh, research also showed the same theme like women don't support other women. They also had questions like, how do we earn the seat at the table? How do we, you know, build presence? How do we build influence? So, you know, as a board member who's also experienced this journey and therefore got the rightful seat at the table, love to get your perspectives on how would you answer these questions? Yeah. I also like the quote, lift as you climb. And so it's easier to be in the front and push through the crowd when you know there's a group of people behind you, that you're doing it on behalf of somebody else. It gives me strength to have tough conversations and to push through adversity when I know I'm doing it to help other people. Because if I'm just doing for it for myself, I'd rather sit in a chair and watch TV. Like I'm really lazy. But if I know I'm doing it for somebody else, that gives me energy. And all of a sudden now I have the strength of a thousand people because I have to do it 
to help others. And so through my journey in the corporate world, each time I reached a new level and had a broader scope, once you sort of get a sense of what your job is at that level, then you realize, ah, in order for me to be really effective where I am now, I actually need to be higher because that's where the power and the influence is. And so when I got to the C-suite, that was when I realized it's actually not the CEO that has the final say, the ultimate authority, it's the board. It took me a while to understand. I think I came to really learn this at SAP when I made presentations to the board that that's where the decisions are being made. You know, so I think all of us should think about, you know, why is my boss doing that, the CHRO? Well, his boss is the CEO. Well, why is the CEO doing that? Well, you know, the CEO's boss is the board. And that strategy and that influence from the board is really where the buck stops. If I had known that sooner, I would have been a better C-suite executive because then I really understand the interplays of decision-making. And and when I really learned that the most diverse boards, diversity of thinking, diversity of perspective, diversity of background, race, gender, et cetera, they have the most diverse and successful C-suite, which then has the most diverse and successful executive team, which then has the most diverse and successful corporation. And so if you're at the bottom, you know, you're basically battling windmills. Your voice and your is going to get lost. It comes from the board down. And if I really want to influence change and make the world more fair and equitable and just, because we spend the majority of our lives and the best years of our lives and the best hours of our day at work, and we want work to be purposeful and have meaning and provide joy. And if that's the mission, really it starts at the board. When I had that realization, I was, ah, I need to pivot my efforts from being the best C-suite executive I ever could be to being the best board member I can be. And that's the journey that I'm on now. And I, I started that when I, when I realized all these connections. What is the one toolkit in your toolbox, Jenny, which has been there from then to now, which has made success possible for you? Maybe jumping in the deep end and figuring it out again, sort of circling back. Is it confidence or is it naivete? What's the worst thing that could happen? Go try it. This was really inspiring and insightful, Jenny. Any parting thoughts for women leaders as they transition into larger roles? Be ambitious. If there's 10 things that you need to do a job, women will apply for that job when they've mastered eight of them and there's two left to go and men will apply for the job when they've mastered three of them and seven left to go. I would say go for it earlier. Go for it before you're an expert and learn on the job. Apply, put yourself out there. Just try, jump in. You might embarrass yourself and then you're going to lick your wounds and then you're going to go, ah, oh, damn it. That was stupid. What did I learn? How can I grow through this adversity? You know, it didn't kill me. It made me stronger. Yeah, you earn your seat at the table by taking chances. This is very interesting. You're the 12th person on the podcast, and I think at least six women have echoed the same sentiment. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of learning in this piece of wisdom. Thank you for sharing all your experiences and bringing your authentic self to the conversation. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, my pleasure. It was lovely chatting with you. Thank you very much for listening. All my guests have brought their most vulnerable selves on Atlanta Diaries. And even if a small segment of these conversations can help champion the journey of one person, it's going to be really worth it. I do have a request for you. Please share this podcast on your social media and with your family and friends. Our society is constantly evolving and Atlanta Diaries must too. I really appreciate if you can leave your feedback in the form of a review or a rating. These are impactful and rousing stories that need to be shared far and wide. 
See you next time for another one on Atlanta Diaries.